The heart actually has an intrinsic nervous system that's nicknamed the heart brain. So this is a complex neural system within the heart itself. And the, the afferents or ascending pathways from the heart are more numerous than the ones coming down by a ratio of about a nine to one, in fact. Here we're looking at a kind of a block diagram of the main neural communication pathways between the heart and brain. And we see that the ascending or technically called afferent pathways are, exist both in the vagus nerves to the primary nerves of the parasympathetic nervous system. And there's different estimates, but it's between 80 to 90 percent of the thousands of neural fibers in each of the two vagus nerves are afferent or ascending. But also in the spinal cord, in the that system as well, about 20% of all those neural pathways are also afferent. So there's a lot of information going from the body back to the brain, which it's then interpreting uh, for, for many reasons. The vagus system is the, the more dominant one in terms of carrying uh, information from the body, but especially from the heart. In fact, the largest source of activity uh, going back to the brain from the body is from the heart and cardiovascular system. And in here you can also see the intrinsic cardiac nervous system field that studies this is called neurocardiology, but most of the modern textbooks and, and medical schools are actually still uh, haven't caught up yet. All the neural connections from the, the brain to the heart first connect with the, the nervous system within the heart, not directly uh, to the tissues. Now I talked about these afferent or ascending signals. Once these signals get up to our brainstem, there's direct and strong neural connections to pretty much all of the, our key brain centers. So we now have a, a very clear understanding of the flow of these neural signals and how they can modulate perception and, and brain function. So this gets me into heart rate variability, which gives us a window into understanding the dynamics that are occurring in our autonomic nervous system and the communication between the heart and the brain. So technically, one of the common definitions of heart rate variability is that, is that it's a measure of neurocardiac function that reflects heart-brain interactions and autonomic nervous system dynamics. Uh, here we see um, a diagram of what HRV looks like. So the red line on the bottom is, of course, the electrocardiogram. And if you look closely, you can see that the time intervals between each pair of heartbeats is slightly changing. And the blue line on the top is technically called instantaneous heart rate. In other words, what's the beats per minute equivalent of each pair of heartbeats? So to measure heart rate variability, it's very different than heart rate. So heart rate, obviously, you only need to count how many times the heart beat in a minute. But in reality, our heart rate is changing with each and every heartbeat. In heart rate variability, we have to sample the, the data very high rates to really measure accurately those, those time intervals between each and every pair of heartbeats. If we did not have heart rate variability or this beat-to-beat -beat change, there would be no heart rhythm. This is what underlies it. So if we uh, had no variability and the time between heart, each heartbeat was the same, the blue line on top would basically be a flat line. Uh, and that's not a good thing, as uh, we'll see in a moment. So now here we're looking at a person's ambulatory heart rate variability. These are done with recorders that record the, the electrocardiogram as they go about their, their normal day. So each one of the traces you see here is a, an hour's worth of data. And so it just kind of shows you that the heart rhythms are dynamic. They're always changing. And, they're, and all these changes are reflecting measurable changes that are, are occurring in our nervous system, in our autonomic nervous system. So here in the, in the second and third hour, we see periods of what we call coherence, which I'll show you more clearly in a minute what that is and why that's an important state. But also down in the lower part of the graph, uh, during nighttime, we see what restful sleep looks like and also what dreaming looks like in REM sleep. In fact, we can even tell from the, looking at the heart rhythms uh, during dreaming, whether it's a pleasant dream, a nightmare, that kind of thing, the kind of the emotional quality of the, of the dream. But also, as, we, as you become familiar with these rhythms and patterns, uh, it's, you can uh, pretty much tell almost a person's personality or what uh, kind of an emotional state they're in at any time. Uh, more or less throughout the day. I mentioned this thing called coherence or heart coherence. But heart coherence we now know is a highly efficient functional mode that is associated with increased self-regulatory capacity, our ability to in inhibit our impulses, not charge things on a credit card if we're on a, a budget to, you know, or eat the other piece of cake or something if we're on a diet and so on. And coherence is now associated with a number of benefits to our mental landscape, to our cognitive function, memory, even test scores, but also the efficient utilization of our energy resources. A lot of our focus here is teaching people how to better self-regulate. 
We believe that it's a failure of self-regulation that really underlies most of the, the problems we have in modern society and in people's health. Sign up now on gowsim.com to watch the full presentation.